Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. Thank you for joining Real Estate Risk Report. I'm your host, Lance Peterson. So today I have with me again, our esteemed guest, Ryan Parson with Mile Marker Club. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing well, Lance. Thanks uh, for having me back here today. Yeah. So we, you know, we like to have Ryan on, you know, every month, every six weeks or so. I think uh, the intent is to sort of tie it all together for everyone, right? We we tend to get into the weeds, um, you know, in individual episodes, you know, spending a lot of time on, you know, particular strategies and and uh, property types and markets and, you know, hitting a lot, lots of those things, obviously you're uh, a fraud case here and there. They're always my favorite, um, some grammar and, and those sorts of things. But I like to kind of bring it back to, you know, just the notion of the, you know, your portfolio on whole, right? How, how to view uh, alternative investments broadly is part of your portfolio. And obviously the largest, I mean, now that has its own designation, but you know, real estate really is the the largest alternative investment class, and clearly the most accessible um, to to you know your average person. <clears throat> you know, versus uh, private equity, and you know, usually have really high minimums and um, hedge funds and stuff like that. It's it's uh, you you can find it these days, but it's not as as accessible clearly as real estate. You, you know, not to mention real estate sort of ubiquitous. It's everywhere we go. So. Um, so today we're going to kind of talk about single family as a as a property type, as an asset type in particular. Um, you know, Ryan has some insights in working with his his club members. You know, kind of reframing. You know, how much exposure in particular. You know, your average investor sort of has to single family, and not that single family is bad, but you know, looking at opportunities to sort of you know, re- rebalance one's portfolio and, and and maybe just step back and pan out a little bit and think about, um, you know, what, what your exposure is for single family. This is one of the things we've been working on and really been prodded on by Ryan on our technology platform on Verivest, right, is to be able to give this sort of insight um, at the press of a button, so to speak, you know, where you can see sort of you know, what is your exposure to these asset classes? So I've got good news for you, Ryan. Um, that feature is is just about ready to go. Um, and at least the, the 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 engineering part has been solved and it will it will see the light of day in in a, a couple of use cases. So um, you know we've taken that you know to to uh, to heart and, and trying to get that created. So anyway, with that said, you know, I know you recently have sold, you know, a long time asset you had as a single family home. And it's sort of what, you know, created the the conversation for you. Why don't you share us a little bit about, you know, wh- what what caused you to kind of pause and, and reassess sort of single family? Absolutely. Again, Lance, thanks for having me. It's always uh, great to be able to visit with you and, you know, kind of just beat up these various different topics and share different experiences, you know, that we've all had with our wealth and particularly in our real estate, uh, you know, parts of our wealth. I know for a lot of us, uh, you know, it makes up a good chunk of our of our overall wealth and our overall net worth. And, you know, others are just, you know, starting to add real estate. Mm-hmm. So I realize it's kind of a broad perspective of where an investor and specifically the high net worth family or the high net worth investor is at today. But what's always uh, uh, fascinating, Lance, anytime this conversation of the single family residential housing unit comes up, from an investor's perspective, most of us, when we made the election to start adding real estate to our portfolio, started off with something related to the single family residential property. And I'm not necessarily talking about the house that we, you know, we and our families live in. Sure. I'm talking about the kind of our first investment we made. So, you know, for a lot of us, we made called our realtor and said, go find me a house that I can have as a rental. And, you know, we acquired that property and that, you know, was a single family house. Others, you know, Lance got started being a hard money lender. So, uh, you know, a rehabber, another real estate investor, 
you know, came to you as a private investor and said, hey, oh, hey, will you fund this acquisition and the rehab? So you were maybe a hard money lender secured by the single family residential property. Mm-hmm. You know, others, you know, may have started their investing career or been part of actually buying the properties themselves and doing their own rehab and selling it out. But in most cases, Lance, we can all kind of track our uh, <laughs> origin, if you will, of our real estate investing career back to a single family property. And it certainly was, you know, in my case as well, when I when I bought my first, uh, you know, couple of rental properties mm-hmm. almost 20 years ago now. And, you know, that it, it's, it's re- relatively, you know, logical about that. Like you said, single family resi is it's ubiquitous. Um, you can see it in your backyard. You can, um, the technology is such today, you can see properties, you know, anywhere, thanks to, t- uh, you know, the, the mapping systems. And there's so many vendors out there today to do inspections. So single family as an investment is really rooted in its visibility and its ease of access. You know, maybe if we can use those two for Mm -hmm. purposes of today's discussion anyway. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, a significant amount of my wealth has always been rooted in the single family residential space. Um, And, you know, certainly for a lot of other investors that that holds true as well. And, you know, what, what we've also seen over, you know, especially the last decade, if you compare back to the to the great recession you know from the 08 to 10 and 10 to 12 uh, 2010 to 2012 time frame a lot of different funds a lot of different syndications a lot of different you know joint ventures you know different investment structures have emerged on the scene that are then investing back into something real estate related or excuse me single family mm-hmm. residential real estate related and so it's just made the single family resi property as an investment class, again, just much more visible and much more accessible. One of the things, you know, that we, we start to see here and, you know, for my almost 20 years now of being a, a private real estate investor and, you know, the same over the same 20 year uh, serving as a wealth strategist for other high net worth investors and their families. You, you, when you look at the long-term trajectory of the value, you know, the price that which a single family residential property, you know, sells for, trades for in the marketplace, it typically, typically over the long haul follows inflation. You know, if you go back and look at any property um, over the long period of time in most locations, granted, there's always some, you know, anomaly areas like California on the West Coast always seems to have a <laughs> ever increasing, you know, single family housing price, but generally it follows inflation. But you have these periods of time. Um, if you think back to the 2005 leading into the Great Recession mm-hmm. in 2008, you know, all of us were generally seeing housing prices going up and up and up in all of our markets across the country. And of course, you had your hotbed markets like Phoenix and Vegas and parts of California that were really and others mm-hmm. that were really going up. But generally, and we, of course, we all know what the story was after the big run up into 2008, the big reset in those prices that happened. But generally, housing increases with inflation. And we're seeing that now, Lance, uh, certainly you and the PAC Northwest are seeing it magnified with your housing prices and your neck of the woods. But the whole country is seeing, you know, pretty much double digit over the last year over year, you know, from 2019 to 2020, these housing prices. Obviously, this situation, um, while not the Great Recession, uh, like it was, you know, 12 years ago, brought, brought on by the pandemic. And then you've got, you know, interest rates going through the roof. You've got, or excuse me, dropping, you know, through the floor, shall I say. Mm-hmm. And because of the pandemic, we're having a massive shift of the population moving across the country now that they can work anywhere, live anywhere, and all the things brought on by, uh, you know, an accelerated Absolutely. virtual work environment, you know, because of the pandemic. And you've got these housing prices going up and up and up and up. Well, if you bought a property, say, 10 years ago in the last Great Recession, and you've been holding it and renting it and renting it, rents a a, a rental property in a single family residential rental property 
aren't going up as high as the value of that property is. Yeah. And so when you look at the equity you have, you know, driven by the market, you know, that's just risen the price of the property and maybe you've done some value add to it along the way, excuse me, to increase the prices. But when you look at your cash on cash return of the rents that you're getting in relation to the value, most investors are seeing a drop in their return on equity because that equity has gone up so much more than what the cash flow has from that deal. Hmm. And so when you look at it from a financial, just a pure financial planning or cash flow analytics perspective, your returns are going way, way down because you're not really doing anything to change the return on the equity that the market is giving you. And so this is kind of the classic example of, you know, as our good friend, uh, Mr. Buffett always says, buy low and sell high. Not that we ever want to play the market timing game because that's, you know, generally doesn't work out in any investor's favor on the traditional markets or on the private, you know, the alternative types of markets like real estate. However, when you look at the price increase over the last 10 years from the Great Recession to where we are now, those types of double digit increases in the single family property just don't, they can't sustain themselves for an extended period of time. Yeah. And I think that's in part what we're seeing as we go through this next iteration of the market transition, as we work our way through uh, the challenges of a pandemic, um, you know, we're starting to see that. And as investors, we have to, you know, really ask ourselves and be honest, wow, will that continue? So let, let me pause there, Lance, maybe with that a little bit of an intro here. Yeah, no, I, th- I think, yeah. And I, you know, it, my translation of what you're saying, right, is, hey, listen, if you entered and you have some positions in single family, you know, you, you probably have generated some pretty good gains, yes. right? Because you got in a good basis, once again, using Buffett's axiom, you know, buy low, sell high, uh, pretty straightforward stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, the sell high part is, is probably now is when you jump off, right? And not when you jump in, I, I think is to simplify it, right? I mean, it, it's, it's interesting because we do have these I mean, and, you know, but th- that's just, it. I mean, we've got these supply and demand issues, right? There's not any inventory on the market, right? And now people do want that. You've got enough people that are wanting to move and migrate and, you know, move from here to there. And, and of course, the people that are in their homes that like where they are, they're not moving. So there's no inventory, which of course creates a supply and demand issue and prices go up. So right. of course it's enticing to ride that even further, Right. And, and who knows? But once, like you said, is that if if you've got locked locked in gains, now you might as well harvest. And it, this is where the, this is where when you pan out, I, you know, from a portfolio standpoint, is just say, hey, maybe now is the time where you start to sort of rebalance the portfolio, get some of that, you know, remove some of the exposure to single family, harvest those gains, reinvest them in other areas where you can, you know, buy low, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of do a reset. Is that is that sort of what you're getting at? Yeah, a- absolutely, Lance. And you know, for most investors, whether you're talking about a traditional investment portfolio or an alternative investment portfolio, you 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 keep going with what you know. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. I mean, you want to know what you're investing in and have a good working knowledge of it anyway. The types of deals that you're investing in. But again, single family, where I think some investors maybe have got get a little, um, you know, they, they lose some congruency with things from a diversification standpoint of go, well, I don't, yeah, I'm not just buying single family homes as rentals directly anymore. I'm in a fund. And so that's diversification. Yet the fund may be, you know, buying single family homes, for example. And there's a key understanding of what is the root asset, even if you're using funds, which as you very well know, Lance, since the last Great Recession in 08, thanks to the Jobs Act, funds have become a pretty significant staple for most high net worth investors to invest through. But it's just that it's an investment vehicle into some sort of an underlying asset class. And in most cases, 
those asset classes are connected back to single family properties. So if you're a lender, you know, for example, against those and you're lending, you know, X a percent against the value of the property, you can ask a lot of hard money lenders, Lance, from the last great recession, you know, that got caught and lost a significant amount because their collateral values decreased. Yeah. Now, hopefully we don't see as a significant of a drop like we did the last time, but the fundamentals about what drives pricing of single family housing has to do with housing affordability. Yes. And of course, with lowering interest rates right now, it makes housing more affordable, but yet that's what's pushing up the prices in part. And I still don't, even though, you know, unemployment seems to have dropped back down into the somewhat high single digit range, with you know, which is a good thing. I don't know that we have a full appreciation yet for a homeowner affordability because we still have a lot of stimulus money floating out there, at least presumably till the end of the year. I realize we're going into a new uh, administration here, which will presumably change things. Yeah. But a lot of the jobs that have been recovered have not been at the same pay scales. And for most folks, it's at a lower pay scale than what it was prior to the pandemic setting in. So I don't think we've gotten to a full appreciation of the housing affordability. And like 2008, when if you think about, you know, kind of what happened there with the housing crisis, when all the adjustable rate mortgages started wearing off and therefore people's housing costs mm -hmm. increased, we then certainly remember the death spiral that was created from that uh, economic issue. I think we're going to see some form of that, which will take a while here, but, you know, not the distant while. And this is why we as investors, to the extent we've got exposure, and for a lot of investors, they can tie their real estate investments back to single family, whether you're a lender or you're an equity owner related to that, you really have to take stock of what your valuations of those underlying assets are right now and where they could conceivably go in the foreseeable future. And therefore, what does that mean? you know, to your tenant being able to continue to afford to pay their rent timely, or can they afford to pay it as high as it is now? Or if you're a lender, can your borrower continue to make their housing payment, you know, whatever it happens to be, if their income situation changes, in any event, those have downward pressure on the valuation of the single family property that will inevitably, you know, haunt, you know, create challenges for the investor in their holistic financial plan and their holistic uh, income streams related to that part of their portfolio. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's fair. That's just, I mean, it's, 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 that's what's made this pandemic, I think difficult for all of us in a multitude of ways is that dealing with and trying to process this amount of uncertainty mm -hmm. is, you know, is really taxing and, like this, like this assessment you're running through right now. I mean, that's what you have to do. You have to kind of run it down and then, and then you got to pick the lesser of two evils almost, right. Where you're saying, okay, I do have quite a bit of exposure to this. Here's all the things that are uncertain. And, you know, as it pertains to that, and, <laughs> and then you go and assess your, 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 you know, next best alternative or what, what you could do with that money and then run through and you're going to bump into a bunch of other, you know, uncertainties as well. And I think that's where, I think with this the example that you use with the house that you had sold in yeah. Arizona, whatever, right. It was, I mean, it was a bird. It was a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. Right. I mean, that's the assessment. You're like, I've got a, I've got a winner in hand yeah. and I've got a market that's robust right now. There's liquidity in the market. Right. The, you know, financing is, is very accessible. It's yeah. cheap. It's right. Like, Hey, I'm out. Right. Like hit the button. I'm out. Divest, take the chips off the table for that particular investment. Um, you know, and then that sets you up to say, okay, now where, you know, now where actually I put it, but looking at it holistically to say, well, what, what is missing? What don't you have exposure to, you know, in, in your portfolio? And as you mentioned, and this is the cool thing about the jobs act and all those things, it's just, you, you have the ability really to build a more diversified portfolio, you know, yes. whether it's geographically or through, um, you know, obviously just the different, you know, property types, asset types, 
you know, it's, it's sort of unprecedented. We've never, we've never had this much accessibility and certainly I'm trying to do our part to help even, you know, make that more so, but um, yeah, I, th I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think, like you said, I, I my guess is if you asked your average investor how much exposure they think they do have to it, they're probably, they'll probably understate it. I, I, you're, you're, you're right, Lance. And, you know, here we, here we are at your end and we're, you know, doing our year end reviews with, you know, all of our mile marker club members right now. And as you can imagine, that is a, a topic of discussion because again, for a lot of us, this, this, the investment in single family related assets has done extremely well for us, especially the last decade. So, it, you know, it, it's uh, the market kind of lulls us sometimes into a false sense of security and understanding that and that 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 example that you're referring to you know a property that I bought uh, down in Phoenix back in 2010 literally from the courthouse steps and you certainly remember the the heyday of all of that in those hotbed markets I mean yeah. you were picking up properties for us you know significant discounts you know at that period of time of course then there wasn't nearly as much institutional capital certainly organized uh institutional capital like exists today so it made it easier for you know for the private investor to participate in that and you know that was a property i literally bought for about sixty thousand dollars all in you know, held it for 10 years. And we literally just closed on Monday of this week, Lance, for about 200, 222 or 225 was the resale price on that. And, you know, we've had it as a nice rental along the way. So there's great cash flows. But when you look at just the buy-in number 10 years ago to the, to the exit number 10 years later, you know, that is a low teen, double, you know, double digit type of return. And of course, every investor, we all want that. We all want these, you know, yeah. double digit returns and all of that. And what what's fascinating though, Lance, to me is that the investor that bought that today is not going to make a double digit return on it over the next 10 year holding period. Yeah. And what that's kind of what hit me with this a, there's such a lack of inventory. B, there is way more capital, private capital, especially in the marketplace, chasing any type of real estate deal. And some of these returns that are being projected in a pro forma, whether it's an individual deal like that, or, you know, that's the, those are the types of deals that say like a fund might be buying. And the pur purporting those types of double digit returns, it's extremely difficult to get that today. And I'm just using this real life example yeah. of it. Now, granted, could you cash flow it and maybe do some other things? The answer is yes. And I, I don't want to get too bogged down in numbers here, Lance. But the reason, like, the point of me sharing that is only that that particular asset was bought at 30 cents on the dollar relative to today's price. Right. That's a discounted buy. That's a deal. Yes. Now, I didn't know 10 years ago, of course, when I bought it, I knew what the rents were then. And I'm like, okay, this makes sense based on that buy price then. And of course, we've been able to raise rents a little bit. But I think another big um, lesson that is cautionary, for, should be cautionary for all of us as investors what brought us to the table whenever we started our real estate investing career and for a lot of you know folks that was, has been in the last 10 years as more and more have come into the game um what brought us today which has served all of us very well in most cases won't necessarily keep serving us well or get us to our next level of wealth whatever that is for any one of us as an individual investor and this idea of acquiring assets at a discounter with some relative downside protection to it is really the investors who start making that shift now, perhaps into other types of asset classes within the real estate sector, where some relative discounts exist is going to be important if you want to stay in the real estate investing game for you know the foreseeable future into the next decade. And it may not necessarily be that single family residential housing unit. Yeah, no, I think it's fair. And I think it is important. You know, the, obviously the, uh, the uh, 2008 debacle, it was driven by 
you know, the financial markets and, and, you know, uh, loose underwriting criteria. And, you know, that's sort of what created that problem. And that's, that's where just the institutional capital flooded into that particular market and they went haywire, right? And crazy. Well, the funny thing is, well, it's not so funny, but those same investors that drove that were the ones who then, who had not been up to that point, they all flooded in to buy all of those homes yeah. um, and they became landlords. So for the first time really ever, institutional investors became single family landlords. Yes. And so that is the new dynamic that we're dealing with here. And, you know, and it's, it's interesting because there is this, this notion that we're becoming a nation of renters. And I, I don't personally think that's a bad thing. Um, you know, because it, 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 I mean, it, it's, it's not a bad thing and it's just, it's, it's happening whether we like it or not. So there's that. So of course the market in general is probably increasing, meaning more people, are willing to rent and, and, and choosing to rent. But the fact that the competition now is more than likely institutional capital whose return requirements, and because once again, they do all this other arbitrage and the way that they stack up the RMBS and the loans and the, you know, the triple A's down to the whatever. And, yes. you know, they have all this other financial engineering that they, that goes on behind the scenes that you don't see. That's how they can generate alpha. Yes. So, you know, on one hand, I always talk about with my clients is saying, I mean, that's why I do like about single family just in general is that I like the liquidity, yes. right? But with liquidity, the more liquid something is, then the less of a premium you're going to earn, yes. right? And and so when you look at single family, it it has become much, much more efficient. And, and yeah, I mean, you, you do see these dynamics where like the, you know, like everything, the values keep climbing up and up and up. I mean, I'm from North Mine, North Dakota and- you know, it's just really hard for me to fathom that some of these, like, like these homes are 500 grand or $600,000. And these are, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's just, that's just so crazy to me that just some, you know, 50,000 person, small town and in the middle of, you know, a <laughs> middle a of nowhere, cold state. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a great place, but it's just, it's, uh, you know, some of that is just hard to believe because it just seems like, you know, how can that be? And then obviously look at places like Seattle and yeah. some of these hotbeds or the Bay area or whatever. It's, it's just, there's something there, right? Like it's not to say that over time, 30 years from now, that these homes won't be worth more than they are today. Like you said, but if it's following inflation, then, you know, and it has historically, then you have to sort of assume that it's going to probably stay on that same trajectory. Now, how do you, you know, what does that mean? What do you do with that information? I think that that's where it's important. And I think in real estate investing, it's about finding those, you know, we call them sponsors, right? Like real estate sponsors. Right. There's because of the, 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 the local nature of real estate, right? And it's about who you know, what you know, and your, your knowledge of, of some you know, particular property type or some geographic area. I mean, it's always about you have to go and find the people that know about the deals, right? You either have to figure out how to become that person yourself to extract right. the value because if anything is sort of stabilized or core or whatever, it's hard to really, you're not going to be able to extract too much value out of it. I mean, once again, it probably is a, a decent risk adjusted return yes. um, and might solve part of your problem. But if you're really trying to extract an above average risk adjusted return, it really does come down to, you know, finding those who've developed a unique acquisition strategy you know, and who are in position to find the deal like you did in the courthouse steps. If I lived down in the same place, man, I never would have got, I mean, I wasn't going to go to the courthouse steps and buy a house, right? Like that was all you. I mean, and I know there's other people standing around you that had the opportunity to as well, but it's just, that's how you extract value from the market is when, you know, you've got to be committed to being in the right place at the right time to have the opportunity. Just like I say with Buffett, you know, he, you know, the, Six months before he bought Burlington Northern or whatever, you know, everything was fine. You know, but the day that his phone rings and they're like, dude, we need a bailout. We need, we need help. That's the day when he suddenly becomes very interested in what Burlington Northern's, you know, doing. Yeah. Right. Because he's on the other end of the phone in a unique position. I'm sure he was call number one. Right. And so he's able to strike a deal that others can't. And that's how he generates alpha. Well, look, and I and I and I want to be clear, Lance. I mean, I love single family. I'm not. This is not a, a doomsday or anything like yeah. that. It's just you when you're trying to manage risk. 
at an individual investor, your portfolio level, you have to take stock of some of these things uh, because it might cause you to make different adjusting decisions. And, you know, frankly, Lance, for the high net worth investor, you know, once you've gotten to that, you know, sufficient scale, and each one of us define that for our own wealth at our own personal definition levels, but once you get there, it's really just all about adjusting. It's not about massive shifting or making really fundamental changes, just little adjustments you make along your wealth or with your wealth along the way. And, you know, what I've, I've just come to appreciate is that, you know, none of us make a market. None of us are big enough to change a market. All we can do is, is observe what is happening in the market and then ask ourselves the question, what does that or does not not mean to me and my wealth and my ability to live a life of financial independence you know, from passive income sources that I have a relative degree of control over, you know, comparatively speaking to yeah. publicly traded stocks or something like that, where you don't have any control or influence over the day to day decisions of how the business is being run. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why like it, it, it's, I know with you and your team and why, you know, I mentioned the feature that we're, we've been building yes. to give you that insight um, that you've been after, right? It's because you guys are doing all that by hand, right? And it's always interesting, you know, and this is what happens is you guys have dug in and you go and lay all this stuff out. So now the numbers speak for themselves. So when you're looking at someone's portfolio, you know what kind of exposure they have to self-storage or retail right. or multifamily or private equity, you know, leverage buyout, whatever, whatever it is, obviously to the public stock markets and, you know, just panning out and looking at it holistically, you, you, you can see those things. And I think that that's part, like I said, I, that's part of the issue is that when we don't, when we can't see it and it's just however, whatever picture we're painting in our own minds of what we think reality is more often than not, the picture we painted, it probably isn't, it's not as close to reality as we'd like to believe it is. Right. And, and so that's, I think the other piece of it, right. It's just getting that visibility into yes. which, which does become hard because funds are great because you do get the built-in diversification. But a lot of times I don't think that, and it's not because of investment managers or sponsors are trying to be opaque necessarily. It's that it's even hard for them, right. To give you that insight into, you know, like right now I think of like colonial, you know, yeah. impact fund two or whatever, you know, got all these, you know, loans and first lien loans against whatever. I mean, it, I, I'm sure at any moment's notice, you don't know exactly, you know, what the exposure is to, you know, Utah versus, you know, Texas versus West Virginia versus Florida. I mean, it, it, that would require some work, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't know, let's go figure it out. It, it's, you know, those things are more fluid, right? Cause like you said, you, you buy, you buy notes and you sell notes and you buy some more notes and, and, you know, and that's, that's like a hyper, hyper situation, you know, situation, but even with a lot of these people, you invest in a fund and the fund, you know, it over its life, it buys, you know, it makes loans to these people and those, and you don't, you don't necessarily know, you know, it, it's, you, you, you don't have that information. And so, cause you don't have it, there's nothing you can really do to analyze or assess it. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting, you know, being a fund manager myself, Lance, and, you know, I get, I get to sit in a really unique position, you know, as a wealth strategist for high net worth investors, and then just some of our own in-house in, in deals that we manage, you know, the, the fund manager could be the syndication manager. You know, if you, if you have pooled and a pooled investment where you have, you know, other people's money into a singular deal, as a fund manager, you have to act on what is the best interest of the fund, which is not necessarily sometimes in the best interest of an individual investor. I mean, it, it's easy to say that that's going to be in everyone's best interest, but this gets to the heart of why as investors, especially as we go through this next market cycle, investors have to be able to have, think of their wealth as a whole like a fund manager thinks is the fund as a whole yeah. and, and understand that, you know, time has cr creates drift too, and not necessarily in a bad way. It's just what the needs of an individual investor are today. Um, you know, just like mine with that case of that property down in Phoenix, you know, my, my needs are different today as a, as a passive investor than they were a decade ago as an active investor. 
And so, you know, it makes logical sense for me to do that because, you know, some people might say, well, Ryan, I, why wouldn't you keep that for that cash flow? It was great cash flow. And the, the, for another investor, that answer may have been keep it. Don't worry about the valuation issue. It's a good long-term cash flowing asset. That may have been the right answer, but what for most of us, to your point earlier, from a data perspective, we don't exactly know exactly what our portfolio needs right now from what it needed a term ago or a decade ago or what it might need for the next decade. And if you're not act more actively managing your wealth that day and you know be, being with others that can support you with that, you tend to just keep what you have and let the market do to you what the market may. And, you know, because of technology and so many of these other things and just access that we as high net worth investors have today, you can shift the portfolio more easily today yeah. than what you could before too, even with alternatives. And yeah, that, yeah. that's a good, that's a good thing. That really is a good thing. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not so efficient that you can't, you know, generate outsized returns, but it's, yes. it's efficient enough that you, you, you can, you know, shift things around. So well, it was a great conversation. I love, I love uh, getting into that stuff. And like I said, especially panning back out and really looking at things holistically Mm-hmm. Right. And it's not to overwhelm, but it's, you know, for me, obviously it's, I'm more of a big picture guy. So it's easier to pan out and look at things than it is necessarily to get in the weeds all the time. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's good. That's why I love having you on and, and uh, we'll keep the conversation rolling next time. And, um, but that'll be between now and then we've got uh, Christmas at least. So, you know, Absolutely. Merry Christmas to you and, and yours and your family. And I hope you guys get some snow up there in those mountains. Absolutely. Uh, same to you, Lance. Again, it's always a pleasure to be here with you and uh, your listeners. Uh, it's been uh, an all in all, I uh, feel very grateful, you know, with every, all the twists and turns of this year. And so I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday season and uh, we'll look uh, forward to uh, chatting with you again next quarter. All right. Sounds good, Ryan. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Lance. 